on one edition of representative caucus and a special meeting of the board of directors of West Basin Municipal Water District. So with that, Mr. General Manager, can you see if we have a quorum? Yes, Mr. President. Director Scott Houston? Here. Director Don Deere? Here. Director Gloria Gray? Here. Director Harold Williams? President Desi Alvarez? Here. We have a quorum. Do we have any public comments today? President Alvarez, we have not received any requests for public comment, though this meeting is being held both in person and virtually. If there's any member of the public that would like to speak, now would be the time to do so. If you're joining us virtually, if you can please raise your virtual hand, we would call on you. I do not see any requests. Okay, so then we will move on to our <coughs> regular uh, calendar. And we have some discussion today. The Colorado River Avenue and the Spring Township of the Metropolitan Water District here. So, Mr. General Manager, would you like to introduce her? Yes, thank you very much. And it, uh, I believe that uh, all the directors present today have uh, two presentations. Uh, we'll make the uh, presentations available online as well. We'll be reviewing the update on the Colorado River issues. Uh, uh, presentation first, and as you mentioned, uh, for this presentation, we have Shantia Rosset, our Colorado River Resources Policy Manager for the Metropolitan Water District. Thank you, Thank you for the opportunity to be here. If you could turn off your mic. Oh, sorry. Um, and I am Shantia Rosset, and I'm trying to figure out how to do it in presentation mode. So thank you so much for the opportunity to provide you with some updates on the Colorado River. Um, as you've heard me talk about before, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation owns and operates Glen Canyon and Cooper Dams. And currently those uh, reservoirs are operated pursuant to the 2007 interim guidelines. And because the guidelines expire in 2026, Reclamation is undertaking a process to develop a new set of guidelines to operate those dams. So with the uh, new set of guidelines, we anticipate that there will be a number of significant changes um, for the lower basin and for California. Um, but I did want to highlight some of the things that will not change uh, with the, the uh, next set of guidelines. So um, while the releases from Lake Powell are anticipated to change with the new guidelines. Um, the upper basin's obligations under the 1922 compact will not change. And uh, the Lake Mead releases will change, um, but Arizona, California, and Nevada's allocations under the uh, Boulder Canyon Project Act will not change. And um, the lower basin shortages and reductions that are based on the Arizona uh, versus California Supreme Court decision um, will be adjusted by the Supreme Court decree itself. Change. This is a schedule that Reclamation has provided uh, that shows the major milestones. <coughs> For the environmental impact statement schedule. And along the top are uh, input points from uh, the stakeholders and the public. And on the bottom in blue, it is reclamation actions. And in the red box at the top, um, most significantly for the lower prison states and for metropolitan's involvement, um, we developed uh, a lower basin alternative that was submitted to reclamation for analysis as part of its draft environmental impact statement. And reclamation is currently in the process <laughs> of analyzing um, those uh, alternatives and preparing a draft environmental impact statement that they plan to publish in December. So reclamation has uh, given everyone notice that they are analyzing the following alternatives um, in addition to the lower basin states alternative, the upper basin also uh, submitted an alternative 
along with the Gila River Indian community, the uh, NGOs, um, and what's called the Cooperative Conservation Alternative, a National Park and Fish and Wildlife Service Alternative. Um, and Reclamation is also looking at how the uh, reservoirs would operate in comparison with the uh, what's called current uh, continue current strategies, and that is an extension of the current guidelines, um, the treaty minute, and the drought contingency plan. Uh, they're also looking at a no action alternative. Um, and while we don't know what the preferred uh, alternative will be, um, it the elements of that have to be included in what was analyzed among these alternatives. And so while the preferred alternative may not look exactly like any of the submitted alternatives, it does provide important sideboards um, for what can ultimately be in the record of decision. So um, just to, to take us back to the spring, um, the lower basin states, Arizona, Nevada, and California uh, worked together to develop an alternative that we submitted we thought it was the, the best and do think it's the best of the alternatives uh, that Reclamation is currently analyzing. Um, and it is intended to address the impacts of drought and climate change and a, a holistic and uh, a sustainable approach to the coordinated mm -hmm. operations of Lake Powell and Lake Mead. And it does a few important things. Uh, first, it addresses the structural deficit in the lower basin. Um, and the structural deficit is a way that we have talked about in the lower basin. Uh, the Lake Mead continues to decline um, in, in part because we haven't accounted for the evaporative and system losses, which average about 1.3 million acre feet annually. Um, and so this would be a way to, under most reservoir conditions, have cuts that would address that structural deficit, which will keep Lake Mead higher than it has been over the last 20 years um, and, and stop the decline. Um, and we also are looking at operating the reservoirs instead of just looking at Lake Powell and Lake Mead, instead look at all seven of the major uh, Colorado River system reservoirs, four in the upper basin and three in the lower basin. Um, it will share water use reductions broadly. Um, at the, the higher levels, it will just be among um, Arizona, Nevada, and California. But then at the lowest levels, when we really need to protect the system, um, there would be cuts by, taken by the upper basin as well. Um, it, we're going to build on the intentionally created surplus program that we have right now uh, by uh, having expanded provisions for conservation and storage of that conserved water in uh, Lake Mead. Um, and then we're looking at establishing releases from both Lake Powell and Lake Mead um, under a broad range of hydrologies. Um, because of climate change, we know that there are going to be uh, some very dry potential hydrologies, uh, but we are also looking at very wet hydrologies as well to provide that uh, uh, system efficiencies. Um, so this slide shows a map of all of the reservoirs in the basin, the, the total system contents. And um, this is, as I was talking about a moment ago, one of the major shifts that we're proposing um, from the way that the guidelines currently operate, rather than just focusing on the elevations at Lake Powell and Lake Mead to determine the releases from those reservoirs, uh, look instead at the percentage of the total system content. So like how full is the system? And in doing that, we look at all seven of these reservoirs, uh, Flaming Gorge, uh, Blue Mesa, um, Navajo Reservoir and Lake Powell in the Upper Basin, and then Lake Mead, Lake Mojave, and Lake Havasu in the Lower Basin. Um, and this is a way to provide a more holistic uh, look at the system. So this slide shows um, some of the uh, most important details uh, in terms of how things would operate differently in the Lower Basin than they have been operating under the guidelines. And uh, what the lower basin proposed to do in uh, this system is have reductions uh, to the lower basin and potentially to the upper basin based on the total system contents. And uh, at the highest level, there would be no reductions. 
And then once the system falls to 69%, uh, there would be uh, in the initial reduction zone and it would be reductions in the lower basin and Mexico of up to 1.5 million acre feet annually. Uh, and then that would be followed by the static reduction zone um, between 38 and 58% fall, um, in which we would have that 1.5 million acre feet of reductions in the lower basin. And this is importantly where the system has been operating for most of the last 20 years. Um, we had you know, significant declines in the reservoirs after the drought started uh, in 2000. And you know, for most of the time, we have been in this 58 to 38% fall. And so this reflects where we would operate most of the time if things look like they have in the last 23 years or so. Um, and so this is only cuts for the lower basin. Uh, we have um, put as a kind of assumption or placeholder uh, the, that Mexico would share in proportion to what they have been sharing um, with the current treaty minute. Uh, that treaty minute does expire in 2026. It will need to be renegotiated um, between the, the um, two sides of the International Boundary and Water Commission. Um, so we, we don't know for sure what that's going to be, uh, but the treaty does include a provision saying that they share reductions or uh, and shortages in proportion um, to their uses. And that's about 16% of the lower basins allocation. So we're assuming that they would share in these reductions, and then the remainder would be divided among Arizona, Nevada, and California. And uh, the majority of that would go to Arizona. Um, and so in that, uh, once we get below 38%, uh, things are really uh, blinking red. The system is uh, in real jeopardy at that point, and that's when we would implement the basin-wide reduction zone, and that would include the upper basin. So there hasn't been any agreement at this stage about what the, the share of the cuts would be among the upper and lower basin. In fact, it's one of the reasons that we had a lower basin and an upper basin uh, alternative submitted because there wasn't agreement about this. Um, but the lower basin is proposing that we can't do it alone when things get at our most serious uh, situations. The upper basin has to make reductions as well. Um, and those reductions would go from 1.5 to 3.9 million acre feet. Uh, those are very large uh, volumes of water. And for perspective, um, if we were making cuts in the lower basin, of 2.5 million acre feet or more, all of Metropolitan's rights would be unavailable. They would be cut at that point. And that includes our transfer rights. So it's, it's you, not- Can you say that one more time? Yeah. So if cuts in the lower basin exceed 2.5 million acre feet, all of Metropolitan's allocation would be cut and all of Metropolitan's transfers would be cut as well. So, so these are these are very large and uh, significant volumes of water. And this is part of the reason that um, in California, the metropolitan, we think it's so important that everybody shares in this responsibility, and also that we we do make efforts to keep the system more sustainable over the long term, so that we're less likely to get into these really reservoir situations. Um, and then below 23% is a, the maximum reduction zone, and that's up to 3.9 million acre feet in cuts. So as I mentioned, the um, upper basin and lower basin were not able to reach census in spring, although there have been you know, discussions along the way. Um, we uh, are having those principles for each of the states continue to meet to try to see if they can develop a consensus for a preferred alternative. Um, but there, there still is this major disagreement among the upper basin and the lower basin about whether the upper basin should have to take any additional cuts. Their perspective is that you know, the compact grants them an equal right to use 7.5 million acre feet a year 
and that as long as they're not depleting the river more than 75 million acre feet over 10 years, then they're in compliance with their compact obligations and that they shouldn't have to make any additional cuts. Um, the, the lower basin you know, has different interpretations of these obligations um, and is also trying to shift away from just focusing on like what the compact would provide, which shows that you know, we're going to be a particularly junior priority users in the lower basin like Metropolitan could, you know, face some real jeopardy. We just go by the compact and we get into very dry conditions and instead focus on how to operate the system in a way that's sustainable and reliable for water users primarily. Um, and so we're trying to focus on that um, instead of focusing on you know, what's what happens under the worst case scenario, who's obligated then. Um, so those discussions continue um, in the lower basin. We're also continuing to work on developing further details of augmentation and storage. Um, the, the state of Arizona is interested in continuing to have something like ICS, like we've had with the 2007 guidelines, uh, but they have had much less buy-in because of their large irrigation districts in the Yuma area um, that have never liked the storage program. They're getting a lot of pushback from it. And so um, it's it's a process to, to get agreement. Um, and for Metropolitan, it's the largest beneficiary of the, the user of the intentionally created surplus program uh, by far. We, we have made hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in conservation. We have successfully conserved and stored that water in Lake Mead. We have then used that water in Lake Mead in years like the 2021 20, 20 and 2022. And uh, water project allocations were so low. Uh, these have been important programs for enhancing reliability for us. Um, and these we see as you know an important tool going forward, you know, particularly to help incentivize the large investments that we would have to make in things like pure water in Southern California if the Metropolitan Board decides to authorize that. Um, so these are important uh, and, and I think California is a little more on board than Arizona at this point, but I think that we should be able to get there. Uh, and then within California, uh, we're going to need to begin to develop work on an agreement on um, how the responsibilities for making California's reduction are uh, assigned. So, you know, at, at least at the stage of submitting the lower basin alternative, we had agreement uh, in principle with among Arizona, Nevada, and California about how much uh, each state would take of static reduction. We have not had further discussion within California about who takes what of California's share. Um, and that's going to be very important um, in terms of, of metropolitan's uh, risk in our planning um, going ahead. So um, a lot happening and uh, we'll have a major milestone coming up in December with the draft, the draft um, EIS coming out. Uh, we anticipate that we're going to see changes uh, with the change in administration um, and that uh, we'll, we'll still be working on developing the preferred alternative um, implementation agreements between the states and also uh, implementations for the, the California pieces. And hopefully too, we'll uh, start seeing progress on the Mexico side of it. Um, so those things would be coming to Metropolitan and um, other boards that are contractors uh, in 2020, 2025. Um, so those are the updates that I have for you today. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Very nice presentation. With that, the board members have any questions? Mr. Deere, we'll start with you. No questions. Mr. Rector Williams, no questions. Uh, um, you know, as a question or two, I guess, would be, because um, I, I remember about it almost a year ago, not quite, but people were trying to push this faster, especially if, you know, the election changes parties, not just administration, but parties. Um, so I don't know that it seems like we had a wet winter and some other things. So it sounds like there's not quite as much of a push for the speed there was a few months ago, right? Um, if you could speak to that. 
I think that um, there was a hope that the seven states could reach consensus and that there, you know, was a an aspiration that if the seven states reach consensus that we could wrap this up by the end of this administration so that we have the certainty um, about what the guidelines would be uh, but we have not been able to meet the, the seven state consensus the lower basin and upper basin are still pretty far apart um, and so that's part of the reason that there's just been a, i think an acceptance at this point that the best that we're going to get is the seven states, or pardon me, is the uh, the draft EIS. And the hope is right now is if we can reach the seven states consensus before the end of the year, that that will just have enough momentum going into the next administration that it will, you know, carry us through regardless of which party. Fortunately, Colorado River um, operations don't tend to be particularly partisan, uh, but changes in leadership do affect you know, what the outcomes are, regardless of party. And then the other question I do have is really is with Arizona, because Arizona has had a lot of heavy water challenges more recently. It's been in the press a lot, especially around the Phoenix area, and they just are having extreme heat too. Um, but how is the state of Arizona looking at some of this? Because, you know, I mean, they're in pretty dire shape in some areas of the state. So I'm sure that gives them a lot of incentive to do certain things on their side, but they also, I'm assuming, still want to import a, a fair amount of water. So what's, what's happening with Arizona? <laughs> yeah, so I, I'll start with the imported water. It's a, I, before I was in, California, I did live in Arizona for a while, and it's an article of faith. The Colorado River is their river mm -hmm. <laughs> because it flows like over the, almost uh, half of the state. And so they do not view it as important water. They, um, it, you know, with the CAP like, uh, aside, um, but they're, they are balancing a lot of competing interests right now. Um, so in California, you know, we have the, the five contractors for Colorado River water and you know those contractors uh, work together and sometimes compete over how to manage the water in Arizona they have 20 of the 30 tribes in the basin they have you know the cities the central Arizona project that they and you know most junior priority in the basin and then they have um, the Yuma irrigation districts which have more senior rights and uh, they have very little interest in you know, agreeing with the other water users in the state. And so whereas in California in 2003 with the quantification settlement agreement, um, the municipal water providers in, in California that use Colorado River water worked out these very painful set of agreements um, with the uh, irrigation districts about how to manage uh, California's water use that hasn't happened yet in Arizona. I think that they're likely to have something equivalent to that, but I think that it's difficult for them to reach a consensus um, at this point because there are like very divergent um, interests and, uh, and I think that there's a lot of things that they just don't agree on yet. That said, they've been a, a very productive negotiating with California. And, um, you know, it's, it's a far cry from where we were in January uh, a couple years ago when uh, there was that six versus California uh, situation. Um, it, Arizona has developed the lower basin alternative with us. They agreed to take a, a significant share of the reductions in the static reduction zone. Um, they've been very helpful in trying to move the process forward. Um, but, you know, it, it is it is very difficult for them to reach consensus on all of the, the difficult issues that they're going to Thank you. Director Gray, do you have any comments? No, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there any comments from the public or from Sam? I, I do have a quick question. 
Uh, I know that uh, obviously the state of Arizona and Southern Nevada have shown a lot of interest in uh, Metropolitan Water District's Pure Water Project, and I can understand the strategies from each of the different states and, and possibly it's not part of the conversation for Metropolitan Water District and the state of California, but uh, does Pure Water and projects like that play into these discussions? Are we hearing about these and trying to strategically make investments? Yes, so um, we are. So it's one of the ways that. The potential partnership with uh, Southern Nevada Water Authority and potentially with Arizona enhances Metropolitan's ability to to meet our own objectives in these you know, basin wide discussions is because if we're all arguing for the same thing. It, it, it enhances our uh, ability to get the outcome that we want and. You know, in particular with SNWA, we have been saying, you know, in each level of discussion about storage is that, you know, whatever we're doing, we need it to last for at least 30 years so that it can justify the investments that would need to be made <clears throat> for pure water, water Southern California, okay. that we need to protect whatever water we store from evaporative losses that will need to be have a, an exchange mechanism you know, with SNWA um, and potentially with Arizona so that they could take the water. Um, so th these kinds of things, like we are, it, it is like very useful for us to know that we're making, planning to make this investment um, so that we can start laying down the groundwork um, with the other parties. And it, it is very helpful when we all do it together. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I do not see a request for, for questions. Okay, Matt, go ahead. What are the kind of the key barriers or sticking points between the lower and upper basin at this point? And um, do you think that there's still a chance that the federal government could step in and determine what, what happens? So um, the Biggest issue between the upper and lower basin is over whether the upper basin should have to make any streets reductions under any circles. Um, and the in the lower basin uh, proposal, we are asking the upper basin to make reductions in those lowest system conditions. So starting uh, when the reservoirs are, you know, when the system gets below 38%. Then we are asking for the upper basin to also contribute to the reductions that are made. Um, and, and there are a lot of reasons for that, in part because, like, you know, a lot of the system is above Lake Powell. With, like, you can do all the cutting you want in the lower basin, and that doesn't prop up Lake Powell necessarily. Um, so this is this has been, you know, the most significant sticking point with us. Um, but there are other issues as well, like they want to keep Lake Powell higher for no particular purpose. They just want it to be higher. They want reductions in the lower basin to kick in earlier. They want the lower basin to take larger reductions. Um, they haven't made any assumptions about Mexico participating. Um, so there are, you know, there are a number of ways that we're we're not in agreement, but it's it's the, the real, I think, sticking point between the two basins on whether the upper basin and the um, the Bureau of Reclamation is, I think, I would say, relatively unlikely to weigh in in a way that's really going to be helpful in facilitating this. If they were going to do it, they would have done it already. Um, the there's legal differences in the way that the upper basin and the lower basin operate and reclamation's authority in each. So in the lower basin, you can only take water uh, from releases made from Lake Powell, Lake, pardon me, Lake, Lake Mead by contract with the secretary. And the secretary is the water master pursuant to federal law. There's nothing like that in the upper basin. There, you know, water users take their water mostly directly out of the river. It's not from releases that are made from a dam. There's almost no reclamation involvement up there. And so, uh, and there's no federal law that establishes the secretary as the water master in the upper basin. And so there's much less legal authority 
for the secretary and yeah. the basin. Um, it, except with respect to operation of the power. So the reclamation, I think, has been hesitant to really weigh in in ways that would be controversial with the upper basin. Um, and this is a, a real sticking point for the upper basin is on this question of secretarial authority. Um, and, you know, the, with the Biden administration winding down, um, it's, I just don't see it very likely that reclamation is going to uh, stir things up in a way that would leave something at the, the, at the door of a potential Harris administration. Um, and, or, or that it would, the, you know, above either administration, depending on who's elected. Uh, so I, I, I don't think it's very likely. Um, and it, it's also one of those things that even if Reclamation did try to do it, it might lead to litigation. The upper basin might decide that it's worthwhile. Well. So, you know, I think that the desire to have certainty and avoid litigation is our greatest, um, you know, potential for reaching. We'll see where we'll get there. Any other questions? Kathy, thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation, and you did an excellent job of answering the questions. I think you took um, provided a lot of additional background. Thank you very much. So we will move on to our next item, which is the public opinion research and outreach for pure water in Southern California. We have Ms. Lisa Mendez from Central Fall Water this week here to present that. So Mr. General Manager, would you like to introduce her? Yes, thank you very much, President Alvarez. Uh, I'm very excited about having this presentation uh, here today. I had an opportunity to do this at one of the uh, Metropolitan Water District Managers meetings, uh, and I think that every person there uh, found the, the research and the information that was provided not only uh, interesting, but very informative and helpful to our agencies. A lot of times, uh, research like this costs quite a bit, so having Metropolitan Water District take the lead uh, and really uh, do the work for us uh, helps out. And then of course we can utilize this in our communities. So as you mentioned uh, for this presentation, we do have Elisa Mendez, uh, our uh, professional public affairs representative in the community relations department of Metropolitan Water District. Thank you, and I hope you can all hear me okay. I appreciate that introduction. I represent our community outreach team um, at, at Metropolitan and External Affairs where we provide support, um, stakeholder engagement and outreach for programs like Pure Water. And so today I'll have just a quick overview of our outreach activities um, through, through, through date today and also uh, provide an overview of the research that we conducted this spring where we wanted to gauge public opinions and attitudes on the program, on the Pure Water program on recycled water. And we did have some questions there uh, to gauge opinions on DPR. So I'll go ahead and start here with an overview of the system. Thank you, again. just a moment. Here it goes. And so here's um, a, an overview of the program area. And what we have here for the Pure Water Program is an opportunity, but also responsibility, where we recognize that although there is a great benefit to the region, we have a responsibility to look at the impacts that the scale of construction we are considering for this program will have on communities. And so as we're crossing 20 jurisdictions, uh, looking at a pipeline that will cross over a dozen cities and impacting almost 10 million people, there are diverse communities with different needs. And so having an intentional outreach program from beginning to end is critical for a program like this. And so we've been conducting outreach now for eight years, um, and we've been doing so at the direction of the board and ensuring that our outreach tracks key milestones of the program. And we've been able to do this through our partnerships and our collaborations with our member agencies and supporters, uh, specifically looking at our project partner, our source water provider, LA County Sanitation District staff, and our member agencies. A really good example of where this collaboration takes 
place, just, just to give you one in the interest of time. On a monthly basis, we meet, uh, we have a work group meeting where we invite LA County Sanitation District, public information officials from every member agency, and even some consultants when we're looking at a strategy for a particular um, key initiative of the program. And this is where we share information, this is where we get information, and here's just a couple examples of that collaboration where we can get out there in community and do so together. Another really important relationship that we've been pursuing is uh, relationships with several communities. Mm -hmm. These CBOs are widely recognized for the trust that they have, and, and especially in um, diverse communities. And so we've been looking at ways to collaborate where we find some parallel with their objectives and the objective, objectives of the program. And so we've had some really great engagement the last couple of years. I'll just highlight a few here. Active SGB is based out of the San Gabriel Valley. And one of their missions is to support sustainability, health and wellness for their communities. And so we organized a series of bike rides where we anticipate there will be program facilities. And so we got an opportunity to engage with that community, share information about pure water. And we did so in a way that spoke to the heart of the mission for this particular uh, CBO. We also wanted to engage with the Spanish speaking community. 40% uh, of that program area includes um, residents that speak Spanish as either a primary or secondary language. and so. We had really great engagement providing uh, bilingual tours, Spanish speaking tours, engaging with uh, ambassador groups. Uh, there's one in the city of Carson through SBCC called the Carson Promotoras or Carson Ambassador Group. And they came in with their uh, excitement, energy, and wanting to learn and take this information back to their community. The last one I'll um, highlight here is an engagement that we had with LA County Sanitation Districts and Nature for All. We hosted a tour of the Innovation Center in Carson and completely in Spanish, but we also had a workshop on their environmental impact review process. Again, this process can be technical, uh, you know, challenging to understand in any language. And so by providing this completely in Spanish, we removed that barrier of language, provided information, you know, where they could understand it. And also uh, key to this is how they get involved in understanding potential environmental impacts to their communities. And so we hope that this information was well received and prepares them for when we take our EIR for this program out into the streets next year. And so you may have noticed a lot of our engagement takes place at the Napolitano Innovation Center. For us, this isn't just you know a cutting edge research hub where we're gathering all this critical information for the program to keep it moving forward, but for us, it's the heart of our program. Since it was commissioned, we established a tour program that has welcomed 11,000 people uh, from all stakeholder groups and students. Students from elementary to PhD have come and toured this facility. It served as an incredible backdrop for events. Many of you have participated in these events, uh, celebrating the receipt of $80 million, which is really funding a lot of the work that we're doing now with the program. We hosted USBR's um, announcement of recycled water grants. And uh, more importantly, and special to us, is dedicating the facility to um, our water champion, Congresswoman Napolitano, last year. And so we recognize that not everyone will come to one of our tours or engage with us at a community event. And so we want to ensure that we are meeting people where they are. And what that means is providing information the way they want to access it, they can access it, and what makes the most sense to them. We have a quarterly newsletter that shares highlights about the program. We're very active on social media and we have a reason to be. We have a lot of great engagement for this program on a weekly basis. Our materials are all available in Spanish and English, but on our website, our dedicated website, which is a historical record of this program, you can find this information available in 15 different languages. And so what does all of this do? This is allow us to reach millions of people to date sharing information about the program, getting support for it, and educating people on the benefits of water reuse. And so critical to any of these strategies is the strength uh, of our messaging, the clarity and strength of our messaging. And so following the release of the direct quotable reuse regulations last year, many of us saw this sort of introduction of the toilet to tap concept again, and basically all media levels, you know, we thought we were going to get any sympathy from our local news channels, we did not. And so we thought this would be a good opportunity to re-engage in research that we've done in the past. We this research in 2017 and 2022, working with FM3 research. 
to look at you know, uh, support for the program, awareness of recycled water, and generally speaking, kind of gauge where people are and test our messaging. And so we uh, began this research again in uh, the spring of this year, looking at quantitative and qualitative research. We did focus groups in person in English and Spanish. And we also did a resident survey with a sample size of 1,000 people in LA County. And so I do want to preface this by saying that uh, a lot of the research today is going to be at a very high level. If you're interested in hearing this in more detail, like uh, your general manager has, I'm happy to provide you with those resources. But today we're just going to share some general highlights in the interest of time. And so the first thing we wanted to do is sort of get a basic understanding of what the perceptions are of local water supplies. One question that we asked, and we've asked this before, and we received similar results, is when you think of water that you drink at home, what is that water that you drink? And so by and large, people continue to filter their water, either by having some kind of device on their sink, filtering it in a pitcher, or um, getting it from the refrigerator. Uh, second to that was continued use out of water. So we leaned into that question and asked why. This is before we're providing any information. And generally, it's a matter of preference. Uh, our concerns with taste and odor, and just maybe a lack of trust in our, in our tap water. Uh, directly coming without any kind of filtration. Uh, we also wanted to see what people felt in terms of delivering options um, of water for our region. If we look at the different ways that we ensure that we have adequate supply, what are the levels of support? And so we gave them these options, including desal, um, imported water, recycled water, and uh, rainwater capture. And so there was a strong support for rainwater capture overall. Uh, and I think that that's, a, we, we think mainly that's because we asked during the season where we sort of just got back from having two rainy periods. So we think that timing had a lot to do with that being top of mind. Uh, importantly though, um, all of these options uh, were supported by a majority of the residents that we pulled. And so there is good support, including uh, support for recycled water as a way to deliver water and adequate supply to our region. The other thing we wanted to sort of gauge is familiarity now with recycled water. And again, similar to 2022, there continues to be a general um, understanding of recycled water. People see it in their purple pipes. They, they understand that it's there and that we're continuing to use it. And so um, we see a, you know, a moderate increase here. But one thing we will note is, generally speaking, when you ask people about an important topic such as water, they tend to say they know about it. How much they know about it, that's subjective and that's something sort of to, to keep in the back of our mind. Now, here are two slides. There's a lot of information on here, so I'll just go through these um, with a little bit more detail. Uh, so residents overall continue to support recycled water for non potable purposes. And so what we see here, again, people are very comfortable. They think it's smart that we're looking at reusing water. When we're looking at landscaping, irrigation, or industry uses. But when we begin to talk to people about other options, such as sending it directly to homes, groundwater, recharge, and drinking, you can see that those numbers are a lot lower. Uh, the other thing we wanted to look at here is when we talk about non potable reuses, then there is support. Uh, there's a different reaction to water once you introduce it to household uses. So we had two sample side, two samples here. We had a split sample where we asked people how they felt about using this water for dishwashing and laundry. And so there was really good support. There was about 71% overall. And then in the split sample where we included showers that proximity and direct contact did have an impact on the support, taking it down to 63%. Now on the other slide, um, next to the slide where you're looking at the different options, we talked a little bit more about the delivery of this water. So we no longer said, okay, this is the water you're drinking, but we focus more on the way we would deliver this water to your homes. And so when we expanded on groundwater recharge, the benefits of an environmental buffer, when we talked about blending this water with other surface water um, um, opportunities, there, there was an opportunity to, again, treat the water. And so as we begin to describe these delivery methods, the same people that gave us, you know, sort of a different reaction in terms of support um, changed their minds. So just to reflect on one here, so for groundwater recharge, 
after providing a better description, we have 74% of support. Whereas before, when we just basically asked, you know, what do you support without not a lot of information, that number was at um, 66%. So you sort of see here the beginning of what information does and messaging does to uh, sort of get people to um, support programs like this. Um, another thing that we wanted to now focus on is support for the pure water program specifically. So we, what we did is provide a general overview of the program. Oftentimes you're going to see this general description on our brochures at the top of our dedicated website, maybe in the first few slides of a presentation. And when we provided this initial um, description of the program, uh, support for the program was about seven in 10 respondents, so at 69%. One thing that we did know, though, is that the intensity of the support in terms of strongly support of the program did go down from 2022. And again, we think this is because of timing. If you think about 2022, we were in the throes of the droughts versus uh, this year when we did this research, you know, we came out of those uh, wet periods. So we, again, think that timing has a lot to do with the response here. And so this is what we leaned in, sort of, you know, asking, you know, what are your reasons to support the program and also what are your reasons to oppose it? And, uh, you know, these are just very anecdotal responses, but by and large, in terms of support, people see a need to expand our nitrate, diversify our water supply. And so they think that this is an important thing for us to consider in order to have a resilient future. And in contrast, those that didn't support it essentially just feel that there is uh, potential contamination, potential system failure, and they just don't trust in the water quality. And so here's what we began to look at the impact of our messaging. And here, this slide, what it provides is a list of positive statements. What we did is we had the uh, residents take a look at these potential messaging and rank them in order of you know, how persuasive they were, how convinced were they to support this program given these questions. And so a rule of thumb, generally speaking, any statement that you provide that gains 40% or above is essentially um, a statement that will have a, a, an impact on the respondent. And so um, the good news here is that the, the three responses uh, or statements that provided support are the ones that we are leaning on for our messaging now ensuring that we have a future um, for generations to come that have reliable water supply, ensuring that we have resiliency in the face of drought and climate change, and our standards for monitoring and ensuring that we have high water, high water quality or at the top here. We did the very same thing with critical statements. Um, in this slide, the statement is sort of one um, paragraph, but essentially we threw everything out there that a critic would say about this program and saw what that did in terms of the support that the program received, and there was an impact. And so initially, uh, after that description of the Pure Water Program, we were at 69%. After applying the positive messaging, that rose up to 73%. But after those critical statements were read and we asked again for their support, uh, the overall support for the program went down to 56%. Still above, you know, in terms of um, the majority, which is good, but we, we see here the importance of messaging and uh, being ahead out there for what critics are saying about the program and engaging constantly. And so in terms of key findings on um, public opinions, uh, definitely residents see a need for us to look at different opportunities you know, to expand our water portfolio. Uh, there is more familiarity. Um, familiarity has gone up by seven points, which is good. It's modest change, but in, the good, in a good trajectory. Uh, mesi uh, residents continue to be most comfortable with um, recycled water for non-potable uses, but with information that we share with them, you can see that they begin to support programs like this and be a need for them. And in terms of delivery, groundwater recharge, again, is the most favored method of delivering purified water to homes in the future. And so this research sort of uh, concluded just a few weeks ago. We're synthesizing this. We're sort of figuring out how we can apply this into our messaging going forward. But some of the things that we um, see that are positives here is that we can adapt our messaging, especially as we consider DPR alternatives. Uh, we um, 
are encouraged to continue to ensure people are aware that we're working with regulators such as the Division of Drinking Water, uh, California State Water Resources Control Board, and they are all interested in ensuring that we continue to have public health um, and that this water is safe and of high quality. And so um, those are some of the emphasis here that we, we are working on developing and, and incorporating into our messaging moving forward. We will have additional um, presentations on this. In fact, at Water Reuse, in a couple of weeks, uh, we will be having a presentation on DPR messaging and the results of this um, research. And so in terms of moving forward with outreach, we want to continue to have this high engagement. We're seeing here that that is something we definitely want to continue to do and need to do. We want to continue to expand our partnerships. Uh, we're looking at workforce development opportunities. We're actually having really good conversations now with West Basin, the city of Carson, LA County Sanitation Districts uh, for residents in Carson to see where there are opportunities. Um, in terms of key milestones, one thing we're preparing for is a public engagement plan for uh, the draft EIR that's um, looking to uh, go out in the first quarter of next year. And uh, always, we want to be responsive to what the board is considering and their direction. And we know there's considerations for uh, rephasing the program and other DPR alternatives potentially introducing them sooner. So we're preparing for that with our outreach. And with that, happy to answer any questions. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Lucy. So, board members, do you have any questions? Director Gear? Very good report. Thank you. Director Williams. I agree, and uh, it's exciting. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting more involved in the uh, marketing. I think that the marketing is very, very crucial. Do you know that uh, some people say marketing is everything? It's like when you're marketing for uh, Things like uh, uh, campaigns, political campaigns. You see how important marketing is. And that's why some people make it their life. Well, well I'm all going to start. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And, uh, and I like your enthusiasm. Thank you. Very good. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you very much. And it's good to hear where these, these folks are at at this moment. And good to still hear that the majority is 55%, you know, give or take, do trust in recycled water. Um, you know, even recently in our own region, South Bay, uh, usually when I talk to people and say I'm with the water district or what have you, and most of them are pretty familiar with West Basin, um, and they're familiar with our plant in El Segundo and recycled water, and a number have toured it. And the majority of people around here, in my experience, have been trustworthy, but lately I have heard some folks who have said, well, I wouldn't drink the water. Um, I, I don't mind the outdoor irrigation and some other things you guys do, but I wouldn't drink it. And so I, I do feel we have to continue pushing the message of the health and safety of that water. <laughs> um, and so, my only addition to this would just be, I think we all need to do more tours of our facilities. We've got to really showcase the science of it and we have to have people experience it. And so I think we all need to do everything we can to literally get people to come and be able to drink the water. I know we've had issues with the regulators, but I think we need to have that experience for people because you know, it, the science speaks for itself. It is trustworthy. We just have to keep pushing that. And you know, this experience is what really brings people in. And I don't know, this didn't have it, but I don't know if age has anything to do with it, maybe or not. Maybe some of the younger folks accept it more than older. I don't know. Um, and that would be something to maybe look at as well. And then lastly is, um, this didn't have it, but you know, I know in the past when we've polled and, and others probably have too, is, is the trust in your local agency, which of course that's across the board. So I think that's probably very key too, depending on where people live, where they're getting their water, um, the reputation of that supplier or the district can mean a lot. Now, fortunately, West Basin has a really good reputation of those who know who we are. So, 
anyway, big picture of the comments, but I, I just think we've got to ramp up more of the tours. I know it's expensive, but that's what people, um, it really sells it, if you will. And, uh, and lastly, I have seen that to be quite frankly bipartisan in this, in this state, because I've also been on some other tours of facilities in the state. And it's interesting when you hear, I'll just be frank, a Republican or a Democrat, but when we were having conversations about it, all of them said, people need to see this, people need to see this. So there's something we could all agree on. So I think that these, all of our agencies, we've got to put some money behind more tours, more get people literally in these facilities and then also push the science side the trust. <laughs> Those are my comments, but this is great information. Thank you. I just wanna say that I completely agree with you. Uh, we also believe that we have to, um, you know, continue to stay out there. It's definitely good job security for us. We have a lot of work before us, but we encourage um, as many people visit us. And so time and information uh, makes a big difference, but it's getting people to give the time and, you know, meeting people where they want to be and ensuring that you have an opportunity to share that information that really does make a difference. Um, to your point about, um, you know, looking at demogra demographics, we did, uh, we just didn't have a lot of time to get into those uh, details today, but the information that we did look at, looked at age, looked at bipartisan levels, um, looked at gender. And so we do have some results that kind of lean into uh, demographics and where we can sort of work to convince certain people. Um, but again, I completely would agree with your comments and that, that is the work that we have before us and, and opportunity and challenge. Thank you. Director Deer, do you have any questions? Um, Director Gray, do you have any questions? I have no questions, but I do have a comment. I want to thank both ladies, Kathy and Alisa, for the presentation this morning, very informative. So thank you very much, ladies. Yep. Uh, Mr. General Manager, do you have any questions or anybody on the... Uh... I don't, but that's because I've had a chance to review this. Maybe what we could do is also I could send out the detailed uh, one that, that I've seen before because it does, uh, as Lisa says, they ask a lot of questions, looked at it, everything from every different angle. Uh, so it's pretty interesting stuff. Does anybody else have any questions? Yes, no. Uh, um, I have a couple of questions that have come. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, you were kind of describing some of the outreach um, and, and discussions with uh, people you reached out to and interviewed that people understood or had an idea of what recycled water is, but they really um didn't have a lot of depth into it um so is that the recycled water is just something that's being reused but they don't have a level of understanding of the level of treatment and the quality that's exactly right um depending on who you talk to they have a general concept of what recycling is in general we recycle cans we recycle paper and so they don't really understand you know, different levels of usage depending on what your the purpose is, you're going to have different levels of treatment. But when we begin to talk about wastewater, cleaning it and purifying it to a certain standard, and then talk about potential uses and delivery methods, that's where we begin to see, you know, different reactions, more questions, and how more information impacts the level of support they have for those different uses. So, one of the things I think we do need to do is do a lot better job of educating the public about recycling water and what we mean by that. I think in the past, we've been very effective at reusing water, but we haven't been a very good deliverer of the message. And some of the things that we've done, which have been for public health reasons and so on, tend to leave the, uh, the public with kind of a quasi uh, acceptance of recycled water. So in a lot of places, it, most of the public sees recycled water in irrigation and parks and medians and public areas, but they also see these little signs that say do not drink the water. And that tends to say, well, recycled water is not something that we are gonna should consume. And so when we're talking about reusing the uh, water supplies, you know, basically, uh, recycling all the wastewater, portable water. 
that messaging really change. Um, we, we need to do a lot better job of the level of treatment and how the quality of this water surpasses most of the water they're drinking today. And that because of the level of treatment, we even have to add minerals and so on to the water after it's processed. Um, I think Director Houston made a comment about the fact that when we tour people through the plants, a lot of people don't like to drink the water. I think one of the things um, that's very effective is whoever leads the tours and so on should just start drinking the water just to show that, hey, this is something that's very drinkable. And then the public can say, hey, you know, I'll try it too. Yeah. Kind of lead by example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and maybe that message needs to go out more to the water industry people that are kind of in charge of these facilities, uh, that they need to set that example. I've known a lot of times the tours get concluded at these facilities, and then somebody says, well, does anybody want to drink the water? I would take the other approach. I would go drink some of the water to show this is the final product, this portable water so you can drink. And then after I drank the last, I would say, does anybody else would like to taste the water? That kind of thing. So that messaging, um, I think we need to push that out more to the water industry that they need to really take up on the messaging. Um, and then on the impact of the messaging and the outreach, we had a slide number 15 up there. We had a lot of positive statements, um, but was there only one negative statement that was presented? I appreciate the clarification. So, in fact, um, just just because there's only so much I can squeeze in one slide, um, this first tier of positive messaging is just one tier. In fact, there was like three different tiers of questions. One actually focused on the level of treatment in comparison to bottled water. There's another one that focused on the fact that Orange County has been doing this for a number of years and that generated a good response. And we had a similar format for critical statements. They were again, and you know, focusing on cost focusing on you know potential contaminants basically any sort of criticism that we've heard was provided so no it wasn't just one uh, we also asked them to rank and um but in the interest of time we wanted to just kind of put it on one paragraph here um but it, it has a similar process both for the positive statements and the critical statements just in reading the, the ones on slide number 15 here the positive statements are several and they tend to be uh, uh, positive. The critical statement is to be very negative. Um, and so if you present it that way, you're always, you're kind of planting the idea in someone's mind. That, by the way, if you do this, you're starting out with something that's really bad and it's full of real contaminants and you're being exposed to that. So if, if these are the statements that are being created to ask the questions and solicit input, I would focus on how I would phrase that question. I, I think that that that, ne that critical statement just has too much negativity and brings out a lot of it, it, it brings out a very poor reaction. If that's all I ever understood, and that was the way it was first presented to me. Yes, I, I, I think a lot of people would agree with you in that. You know, we even when we did the focus groups, people said. Well, why did you now show me the critical statements? Now I'm back to where I started. And so um, a simple, I, you know, that's reality. It's what's happening out there. We have really no control of what people hear, whether it's true or not, what the sources are. And so what it is for us, it's, it's reality. We need to continue getting out there with our positive messaging, the, the messaging that's effective and sort of, you know, counteract that as much as we can. Uh, but to your point, yeah, we agree, you know, it's, it's the way you frame it, but it's also our way of making sure that we're actually mimicking what's uh, reality, what's happening out there in terms of the critical messaging that people are receiving about this water source. Maybe when we present it, instead of saying it contains some things, it's, we start with wastewater, but we remove from a very advanced treatment and explain that, you know, back to a better explanation of what we're saying and the technology that's behind it so that the public understands that they're getting a very high quality and pure water. Um, and, and in many cases, almost in all cases, better than the water than we're drinking today. Appreciate your point of view and that's the thing that's being taken into consideration then moving forward and we, when we do this research again. 
I'm looking forward to seeing the breakdown of the demographic. Yeah. Data. Yeah. Maybe you have an opportunity to do that. It would be very interesting to you. Yes, I think that one's like 50 plus slides. So very detailed, and we'll be sure to get that to you. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, we don't have any other presentations for items, so we will move on to director's comments and future agenda items. Uh, Director Gear, do you have any comments or future agenda item requests? Not at this time. Director William? No, thank you. Director Houston? No comments. Thank you. Director Gray? No, thank you. Okay, with that, I don't have any either. I'd like to thank you, ladies, for your presentation. Excellent job. And with that, we are adjourned.